we, are we 12.30? Oh, sorry, 12 o'clock. Great, good morning, um, and thank you for coming to our event at this pretty amazing venue, um, as well as those joining online. Um, my colleague Thomas was due to host today, um, but he's developed some nasty flu-type symptoms, uh, and so you've got me as a last-minute stand-in. If I'd known, I'd, I'd definitely have brought forward my pre-Christmas haircut. Um, Thomas's symptoms are a neat segue to the fact that the last time we did a, a live event was actually on the 4th of March 2020, just a week before lockdown started to be implemented. Um, a lot of time has since passed, um, but this is the first event we've arranged, which includes an in-person option for wealth managers. So it's a relief that so many of you have showed up in person as, as well as online. Um, we'll be canvassing all of your views later this week on whether to extend the, the format further next year, so please do give your candid views on that. What March 2020 and December 2022 have in common is a bleak short-term outlook. In March 2020, the realisation was definitely dawning on us that we had a real problem with COVID, and it was really going to severely affect markets. Now we have a real problem with inflation, and markets have already reflected at least some of that. However, the best returns are often achieved when the immediate outlook is bleak. We may not yet be at the point of maximum pain, but I think it's a great time to be thinking about where the long-term opportunities lie and where investors might want to add back risk. Uh, we're now going to hear from managers responsible from the Ruffer Investment Company, JP Morgan Core, Real Assets and BlackRock Frontiers. Each offers exposure to a very different investment area and managers with very different perspectives. We're beaming this event live to a, to a broader audience, and so we'll try to keep strictly to timings. If there is time after each session, I may ask for questions. Otherwise, there'll be time at the end for any burning questions. However, each of the managers, as well as other representatives, will be staying for lunch afterwards. So we hope that you'll take the opportunity to ask questions to them face-to-face -face and a bit more informally. For those online, please do email us questions, and we'll get the managers to respond directly um, after the event. So without further ado, um, may I introduce uh, Jasmine Yeo from Ruffa. Great. Uh, morning, everyone, or afternoon, by three minutes. Uh, so I'm Jasmine Yeo. I joined Ruffa five years ago. Um, I took on co-management of Ruffa Investment Company alongside Duncan McInnes uh, as of October. Duncan's with, been with the fund since 2016, uh, but we're familiar with one another. I've been working with him for the last year or so on our daily dealt expression of the Ruffa strategy. Uh, so as we've just heard, we've got about 25, uh, 30 minutes together uh, this afternoon. What I want to do in that time is start with a, a very brief reminder of Ruffa and who we are, look a little bit at our performance uh, for this year and what's been driving that. Um, and, but I want to spend the majority of the time really focusing on, on our outlook. And I think hopefully that's what's most helpful uh, to you in our audience um, where I think we're going and, and what we're doing about it. The reason I think in particular at this juncture that is going to be so important is that we believe at Ruffer the portfolio that you want to have for the next three to five months looks very different to the portfolio that you're going to want for the next three uh, to five years. So to kick us off, uh, to start with uh, those of us that are familiar with Ruffer, um, but just in case there is any doubt, we fundamentally believe that we are now in a very different investment regime. So what's that got to do uh, with a photo of a river? Uh, well, much like Caesar, uh, when he crossed the Rubicon, he paused because he knew that once he did, there was no going back uh, in his march on Rome. He would be entering a new era. Much like that, as I said, we too believe we are now decisively in a new era for investing one that's much more inflation prone, one that's more volatile, and that one that's going to require a very different uh, investment approach. Unlike Caesar though, we haven't got a choice. Uh, this is just what is happening. A confluence of sort of economic, geopolitical forces have firmly thrusted us into this new regime. But what we can do, what we do have a choice of, uh, is what we, what we do about it. I'll come on to tell you a bit more about what I think this new regime looks like and what we're doing. And what I hope to leave you with is an idea of where the rougher, sort of an unconstrained investor, where we've really built our track record on managing and challenging market certainties and regime change, 
if we can help you and your clients navigate through this new era for portfolios. So, brief look at or reminder of, of who we are uh, before we get into it. Uh, we're a global multi-asset absolute return manager where we believe it's our identification of regime change in markets that's allowed us uh, to deliver uh, an almost 9% annualised return net of our fee since inception. Importantly, though, that performance has come with a low correlation to other assets. We've been doing it for 27 years, and we've now got 25 billion invested in this single strategy, of which just over 1 billion is made up of the Ruffer Investment Company. How we define this one strategy is a relentless focus on capital preservation with steady positive growth in all market conditions. And that's with the idea that by avoiding drawdowns in markets, we can take advantage of opportunity that those drawdowns present, perhaps when others are fearful. What that's looked like, how the strategy's played out over those 27 years, is that we've been able to deliver equity-like returns, but with a lot less volatility, <coughs> provided genuine protection in these periods of market stress, which some of which we've shaded in those green areas, and it's been an uncorrelated return stream, so we can act as a diversifier to perhaps more market-driven strategies and risk. So looking back at this year and uh, performance then, it's sort of no surprise uh, that in a year that all conventional asset classes have fallen, which we can see on the left-hand side here uh, in orange, falls in both bonds and equities, that for us, it's been our sort of unconventional derivative strategies that have really driven uh, our performance and the performance of the investment company, which you can also see in green on the left-hand side. By way of a bit of background, um, Ruffer have always used a mixture of offsetting assets uh, in portfolios. And in the likes of dot-com boom and bust uh, in 2008, these were conventional protective assets. So the likes of defensive equity, uh, sovereign bonds, currencies, uh, which was great back in the good old days because they gave you um, a positive carry and you were paid to own those assets whilst you were waiting for those risks to be realised. The troublesome thing clearly about derivative strategies uh, is that you have to pay to own them. So they can be a drag on performance uh, when they're not needed and they're complex, but really we've been owning them for what we feel has been an absolute necessity um, in the current market environment. And ultimately, as hopefully we can see here, that approach has been rewarded. Specifics of what's driven that performance, you can see on the right-hand side, uh, where clearly it's been our option and our credit protection, where those derivative strategies lie, that have done a lot of the heavy lifting. Within that, uh, in the options, uh, a lot of that has been equity downside protection, so both index uh, and single stock puts, and interest rate options, so options that benefit from rising interest rates. And they've been a really valuable part of the portfolio, clearly as we've seen interest rate rises, but also as an offset to the duration that we have in the portfolio given to us by our sizable holding of index-linked bonds, which have had a pretty torrid ride this year, and you can see at the bottom of the chart. Credit protection uh, has also been helpful within that unconventional space. Uh, so this is where we have instruments that benefit from a widening of credit spreads. So what I mean by that, rising borrowing costs, which tends to happen in times of market stress. So another sort of helpful protective asset. And the last thing I'll draw out here is our equity exposure, which for us has also been a positive contributor, sort of despite the wider falls um, in the year to date. And that's a good example of where being unconstrained has been helpful because our equity book has really not looked anything like the index where we've largely not owned a lot of the growthier tech stocks, which have clearly suffered significantly in the year to date, and we've had a large allocation to energy. I just want to spend a little bit more time drilling into those unconventional um, protections, given how important um, they've been this year and how core cool they are to the rougher strategy um, today and how they've helped us navigate the volatility in the year to date. Here, I just want to talk through very briefly a really simple message around protecting against rising interest rates. And as I say, because of that long dated inflation linked bond position that we've got in the portfolio, the fund has been in moments very vulnerable uh, to rising interest rates. Uh, there's a lot of duration risk from these assets, which you can see here in green, which is showing you the gross duration of the rougher portfolio through uh, since last summer. And that green line is given to us from the duration of those index linked bonds. <coughs> 
And whilst we own these assets and we want to continue to own them for our structural views around inflation and this regime change that I spoke about, we've always been very aware and cognizant of the fact that there could be moments like we've had this year where you've got rising interest rates but without the corresponding rise in long-term inflation expectations. And that's a scenario where these bonds are painful to own. So at the end of last year, which is the section that we've highlighted here, we bought a lot of sterling interest rate options and they benefit, as I say, from the rising interest rates and became a very effective hedge to that duration risk, which took the net position of the portfolio, which is what's shown in blue here, um, so essentially neutral or near zero as we came into this year. That's really what's allowed us or helped us to deliver a positive return in a year where one of our core assets uh, has been incredibly volatile um, and almost halved in, in value. So that's sort of the fixed income side, uh, thinking about the equity, that's also uh, a risk clearly we actively manage. What we're looking at on the chart here is the beta of the rougher portfolio um, to uh, the equity market, so looking at the S&P. Coming in at, at the start of the year, we were about 40% in equities. We're currently at the lowest weighting in our history of about 12.5% in equities. And that weighting has clearly steadily fallen throughout the year, and particularly very sharply um, towards the end of the summer. We were doing that both through managing our gross uh, equity book, so buying and selling equity names directly, um, but also through our derivative exposure. Um, so we've had both equity upside exposure, and that really helped us to participate in some of the short-lived bear market rallies that we've experienced, um, August being sort of an example of that and helping the portfolio despite our sort of core view, navigate something different in the short term. And also that downside protection, which I mentioned earlier, which has helped us get through um, sort of the more broader sell-off in the year to date. And you can see here that the green line even dropped below that zero level, which meant we were net short the market over Q3 um, through the use of those derivative downside protections. Um, and that was really with a concern was we put the whole portfolio into sort of a crouch position as we continue to see uh, tightening from central banks and QT um, kicking off. One other way we have managed risk in the portfolio is through allocating uh, to cash. Um, and that's really something that's quite clearly painful to do in an environment of, of high inflation, but something we're comfortable doing when we don't believe there is attractive uh, risk reward available um, in markets. And it's not only is it sort of stepping away when things aren't attractive, but it also helps us to have a very nimble, a very liquid portfolio to ensure that we can step into opportunity um, as and when it arises. And I think there's sort of no better example of this um, than what we saw occur at the end of Q3 uh, last year in the, sorry, this year, in the, already feels like a very long time ago, uh, in the gilt market. So what we're looking at here uh, is the price of one of the longest dated inflation-linked bonds in the UK, the 2068 index-linked gilt. Um, and the dots, various dots on this chart, are moments where rougher have been buyers or sellers of these assets. Now, what's very clear from this sort of nice V-shape on the chart uh, is the calamity that was caused by uh, the mini-budget um, and sort of the sharp falls in the long-dated uh, index-linked gilt market. We had falls of 27%, 24%, and 20% on three consecutive days during that sort of particularly volatile week. Having preserved capital through a lot of those options in the year to date, and having put the portfolio in this crouch position, and having a very liquid, nimble portfolio, we were able to see this and these distressed prices as a pretty unique opportunity to buy up assets that we want to own in the very long run, um, at a very and incredibly uh, distressed prices. Uh, so we were buyers of these assets, as you can see by the green dots, right up until uh, the Bank of England stepped in, where you saw these bonds rally well over 100% on the day, uh, followed by a rally of 16% and 33% uh, subsequently that week. You can then see a lot of those reversals, uh, a lot of those gains reversed. We then became buyers again uh, and more recently have become sellers. So very sort of active and dynamic in trading around what is actually a very core position um, in the portfolio. Really what we're sort of trying to demonstrate uh, with a lot of these examples is that the company can be very dynamic, active and opportunistic uh, in what we're doing. And I think you know, this year in particular, 
uh, that's been very evident. I was speaking uh, to a colleague yesterday and he gave a great analogy. Um, in many ways, the rougher performance uh, can often look like a swan gliding across the water. It's been smooth sailing at a headline level this year, but actually under the water, there's sort of furious paddling going on and there's been an awful lot of changes underlying, which aren't always apparent just by looking sort of at our, our fact sheet or the asset allocation um, at the first level. Um, but there's been a sort of a lot going on under the surface and we think that's something that's going to have to continue um, in order to navigate the outlook that, that we see. Cool. So if that's sort of the year to date and how we've been managing it, thinking about uh, the outlook. Um, markets are clearly rallying um, into the year end. That sort of much love phrase, the Santa rally is, is definitely upon us. Um, that's really markets getting excited about uh, the fact that inflation may well have peaked, at least uh, in the US. Um, as a result, we're starting to draw closer to the point at which the Fed and perhaps other central banks can slow the pace of, uh, of interest rate hikes. And more recently, we've had another sort of shot in the arm to that rally thanks to a potential China uh, reopening narrative. I don't think that's too unexpected. Um, the tightening cycle wasn't going to go on forever. Um, markets were always eventually going to sniff out some sort of pause uh, and perhaps pivot. And clearly, as, as asset allocators and you know, us in this room you know, know no better, that we've had a very bruising year. It's been incredibly challenging. Um, so it's not surprising that I think we're starting to get, and we have seen some of these bear market rallies. But I think the question we're now asking ourselves in and amongst this um, is, is it, is it sustainable? Um, what do we need to see for this uh, to continue to be the case? So I think uh, the presents that the market is hoping that Santa will deliver, um, there are four of them, and I'm, I'm just going to talk you through them uh, on this slide now. I think the first one that market is asking for is that Fed funds peaks at 5% or actually just shy now uh, in Q1 of next year, that that is sufficient to engender an economic slowdown, which either enables a soft landing or, or just a shallow uh, short recession, that slowdown is enough to suck out all of the inflationary pressures uh, out of the system and that we'll be back towards that 2% target by around 2024. And that all of that can be achieved uh, whilst corporates continue to grow their earnings, uh, which are forecast to grow about 3% next year, and that companies can maintain uh, their profit margins in the face of recession, clearly rising labour costs and rising interest rates. So how realistic is this? Um, well, if you put a probability of about 75% on each one of these presents uh, arriving, which I think is quite generous, then you get a cumulative probability of about a third. So to our minds, the market is being quite optimistic. Um, you know, challenging just some of these hopes and wishes. You know, there's really next to no historic precedent uh, for soft landings. Almost every Fed hiking cycle has resulted in some sort of uh, accident or event. We've never seen rapid declines infl of inflation, uh, which are being described here. And the idea uh, that that inflation is going to fall is very much predicated on a lot of the, the issues that the pandemic created uh, starting to normalise. And yet margins are expected to stay where they currently are, which were very much driven up by those same distortions uh, that we saw in supply chains and businesses as a result of the pandemic. So we're spying a lot of uh, inconsistencies uh, in the market's view. And I think our concern, therefore, is that following what we've had this year, which has really been about a discount rate shock with interest rates rising and the effect that that's had on asset prices, is that next year, or at least at the first half of it, could at least uh, be about uh, an earnings shock. I think one reason that's very likely is that we've got central banks deliberately looking for sustained weakness in labour markets. They are actively targeting higher unemployment to try and get inflation back in its box. And what history tells us, and the problem here, and as this chart is showing you, is that when payrolls fall, so unemployment rising, uh, so do earnings. And that is without exception. So whilst it's important that we manage the portfolio and the company through these bear market rallies or Santa rallies, uh, both through our, our gross book and holdings and also our derivative positions, you know, the idea that the market is already pricing a recession whilst earnings are still forecast to grow to us seems a little optimistic uh, 
and is why we remain pretty cautious um, on equities. The other reason for not jumping back into the equity market at this point, uh, as well as there being lots of economic uncertainty, is that you're not really uh, rewarded for doing so. Um, this chart is looking at the equity risk premium. Um, so what do I mean by that? It's the excess return of equities, in this case the S&P, over the risk-free rate, in this case the five-year treasury. It's currently about 2%, um, so pretty low. And despite the pullback in equity valuations in the year to date, despite perhaps expecting the equity risk premium to have increased, it's actually fallen. So with inflation sort of running where it is, recession pending, um, it's pretty difficult, we think, to make the case uh, for equities here. And we're not particularly confident that we've seen the lows in equities just yet. One thing that has tempted us, though, out of uh, some of our cash weighting is the bond market, and in particular, long-dated inflation-linked US treasuries. I think that's quite a nice example of the dynamism in our asset allocation. So six months ago, we didn't own any of these assets. It's now a pretty sizable position uh, in the company. Why? Well, as this chart is showing, there were some really big dislocations um, in real yields, which is what you're looking at here in green, which is inverted against the gold price, such that at one stage, when we initiated this position, you could get the 30-year US uh, inflation-linked treasury and it was offering a yield of almost, uh, a real yield, sorry, very crucial, <laughs> of almost 2%. Um, that, what that means, why is that attractive fundamentally? We were being offered almost 2% real for 30 years with no inflation risk, no default risk, and in a world of uncertainty, we thought that was particularly attractive. Uh, these assets have since rallied about 15%, and we've sort of been managing uh, the position accordingly. As well as being attractive on a fundamental basis, there was sort of some portfolio context here. And we sort of started to describe this investment uh, as one that was double-headed. That's something we absolutely love at Ruffa. Two reasons for being right. And I think as we pass sort of the peak uh, in inflation, in perhaps uh, rate pricing, again, at least in the US, as we do get closer to a point that uh, the central banks can start to slow their pace of interest rate hikes, uh, we will, and we have been seeing uh, yields respond, these assets benefiting, and particularly as and when we do go into recession, uh, perhaps they play a helpful protective role um, in the portfolio as yields compress in that environment. The other benefit here is that it's playing into our longer term structural view, clearly with them being index linked debt. Um, that's something that we want to own um, for our longer term views. Tips are something we've owned before. Um, it's another way that we played sort of a, a rally in markets, um, which is something we owned in 2020 when equity markets fell very sharply. Um, we added a lot of tips and gold to the portfolio um, rather than doing so through the equity market. And particularly, we saw the center of the recovery there through, through tech and duration equities. So that's the sort of the short term tactical thinking. Um, going back to where we started, and Ruffer's longer term structural views, we continue to have confidence in the idea that the big risk to investors and asset allocators, but that we are now in a much more inflation prone economy, but that we live in a much less inflation tolerant financial system. And I think that's what will kick us and take us into this new investment regime. What does that look like? What is an era of an inflation volatility? What we're looking at here uh, is inflation in the US and the UK going back to the Wall Street crash. And we think what this next couple of decades could look like is a lot more, perhaps like the 1940s or perhaps even features of the 70s, and very different to the great moderation, as it's starting to be called, of the 80s to 2020, which are sort of a very distinct uh, and different period you can see on this chart, where today, and we can sort of see a very clear breakout on the right hand side here, we're seeing similar huge dislocations in labor, commodity, goods markets. And we think that will be a, you know, a real cause of inflation volatility and that the next period will look something like that post-World War II era. Importantly though, that we think this inflation will be multi-directional. So that volatility point is really key. It will both rise and it will fall. And that's a much more challenging environment for investors than if inflation was to be elevated and remain stable. A world of inflation uh, volatility will also come with economic growth volatility and market volatility. And all of that means that investors, we think, are going to have to be a lot more nimble and tactical than perhaps the buy and hold approaches that worked so nicely 
through that moderation period. You know, why do we think this is happening? Well, many of the drivers of that period between sort of the early 80s and 2020, that 30, 40 year you know, fantastic period for asset prices, you know, a lot of that was either driven by one offs or by things that are now starting to move into reverse. So of the former, things like the emergence of China and the breakup of the Soviet Union, they have happened, they can't happen again. And of the latter, things like demographics. So going from a very favorable ratio of, of workers um, to dependents to one that is far less favorable, going from globalization to, to deglobalization, um, relative world peace to a world of much more geopolitical tension, which I think is the most apparent clearly today, and supportive uh, politics and policy underpinned by free markets, trade and deregulation in sort of the old regime uh, to one today, which is much more focused on, on big government. All of these structural shifts, we think, lead to this much more inflation prone economy and world. You know, what's, the, what's the reality of this? Well, you know, rather than just taking sort of Ruffer's word for it, um, we looked at some data from the IMF, uh, where it's showing us that on average, in developed economies, once inflation gets over 5%, it's taken a decade to get back to 2%. Deutsche Bank uh, had some similar research uh, where they showed that once inflation gets to 8%, which is sort of roughly where we are in lots of developed economies today, it takes on average two years just to get back to 6%. So history tells us that inflation uh, is, is pretty sticky stuff. But central banks uh, seem to be in denial about this reality. Great example of that here, where what we're looking at uh, is published CPI uh, in the UK, which is the solid line, and the Bank of England's various forecasts of where they thought inflation was going um, through different periods of time, going back from May last year to August of this year. Um, first thing to say is it's incredible just how wrong uh, they got it, but also that in every case, they're expecting inflation to get back to their target um, in pretty short order. So clearly, they do not believe in this regime change. And uh, neither does the market. And that's really been a key driver of the performance or you know, bad performance of those long dated inflation linked bonds in the year to date, um, is that the forward looking expectations of the market, those longer term inflation expectations, which is what we're looking at here, have really not broken out of a range um, you know, over this period, despite sort of all of the events and challenges we've been faced with over the last couple of years. More broadly, you know, the other thing that Ruffa are really thinking and, and worrying about in terms of you know, the direction for asset prices is that we really now are on a journey of the reverse of a lot of the excess that we saw post 2008, where interest rates uh, went to zero and it forced a lot, a lot of risk taking in portfolios. Now, what we're looking at here, and there's a lot of detail, uh, but essentially what we're showing is what was required in a portfolio to deliver a 7% return in 91, 06 and 2021. Uh, in 1991, you could basically earn all cash, uh, own all cash. In 2006, it's a bit of a mixture, kind of 60% in bonds, um, you know, multi-asset portfolio, but still sort of relatively low risk. And in 2021, you had to have 97% of your portfolio in risk assets. If this is what happens on the way up, i.e. when interest rates have been at zero, all of a sudden you can get near 4% um, in a government bond. What happens when this moves into reverse and portfolios shift from looking like they did in 2021 back towards perhaps that more like that 2006 or even as far as, as 1991? This unwind of that excessive risk taking as interest rates start to rise could spell you know, real trouble for risk assets from here and is another reason we remain nervous and continue to have the portfolio majority in protective assets at the moment. So what does that look like? Sort of in aggregate, this is the current portfolio structure of uh, Ruffer Investment Company. Uh, we're still underweight equities, as I mentioned, from that earnings and also that pressure um, from higher yielding fixed income alternatives. But where there are still sums, about 13% in equities um, our highest theme or allocation there continues to be energy. We also have some exposure to Australian uh, government bonds for the currency there. That for us is a low beta way of playing uh, commodities. 
One area which we've talked about where we do have some confidence or certainty is that a significant proportion of this tightening cycle and the action from central banks uh, is, is done and has already happened. And that therefore gives us confidence that interest rate and bond volatility can again start to fall and is why we've been comfortable adding duration in the form of those uh, US inflation linked bonds. And on the other side, uh, we continue to hold protection um, against sort of exogenous shocks or further falls in markets through the form of uh, equity downside protection, credit strategies, volatility and rate strategies. And our cash weighting uh, is still pretty high, as you can see here. And that, we think, allows us to be opportunistic for a further leg down in risk assets and with the expectation of better buying opportunities to come. And then clearly that final green part with our inflation link bond and gold exposure, the time will come as and when those longer term inflation expectations start to shift. We really think they'll be the asset that investors will have to panic into um, and their price will reflect that accordingly. In sum then, um, sort of going back to that analogy that I, that I started with, um, you know, we do fundamentally think that we're in a different world and we have to weigh this conviction and this long-term trajectory inflation, though, that there will be periods um, where going to, there's going to be periods of disinflation or deflation along the way. And that is why we constantly talk about this inflation volatility environment. So on a tactical basis, we've made adjustments, we've added to that duration, we're leaning in to the fact that there could be a, a recession next year and there'll be a stabilisation in the volatility of bonds. But longer term, we do think you're going to want to own real assets to protect you against this higher level of inflation. And that in that environment, structurally, cash and bonds, conventional bonds, look unattractive. We don't think traditional safe havens are likely to work in that environment and therefore paying for protection through the form of derivatives will be essential. You know, this is a world where we think that ultimately passive investing and strategic asset allocations uh, are unlikely to perform in the perhaps the way we would like and that the return of that market volatility and that uncertainty calls for a much more nimble and active approach and we think that we've got the toolkit to help provide that. Thank you so much Jasmine, absolutely bang on time. Um, next up we've got uh, Philip Waller from JP Morgan. Yeah. Click. Is it just there? Brilliant. Cool. Brilliant. Well, um, good afternoon. Thank everyone for uh, coming today. Great to see such a good uh, turnout. Yes. Yeah, so uh, my name is Philip Waller. I am um, one of the portfolio managers for the J.P. Morgan Global Core um, Real Asset Fund. Uh, and part of the broader Alternative Solutions Group Investment Committee, which is responsible for managing this fund, uh, and also other multi-alternative vehicles that we have across the platform. Uh, I've been with JP Morgan for just under a decade, of which the last five years have been with the Alternative Solutions team, uh, really focused on looking after European-orientated uh, or European client-orientated uh, mandates. So. Kind of kick off, I want to kind of give a, an overview for those who aren't um, necessarily that familiar or haven't looked at it before of uh, the JP Morgan Global Core Asset Fund, which I'll call for now JARA. Um, and then I'll move into some of the things we're seeing in the market, um, some of the more structural uh, trends we're seeing that we think are going to drive the opportunity set. And then I'll go on to talk about obviously performance, but also uh, positioning and what we expect to happen going forward. So maybe just a, a brief overview of uh, the way we're set up. So JARA has been around now for just over three years. So in the investment trust space, a relatively new uh, vehicle. And the way we're set up is really as a cornerstone allocation for investors within their real asset bucket or within their diversifier bucket. However, uh, they're defining that kind of diversifying part of their portfolio. And we look to give investors that cornerstone allocation uh, in a couple of ways. And I think you know, first and foremost, it's through uh, the diversification we have. Uh, firstly, across the real asset market. So we are not a, a niche or sector specific real asset vehicle. We are broadly diversified across infrastructure, 
across real estate and across transportation markets, um, giving a good balance of exposure across all of them and allowing us to asset allocate and take advantage of opportunities we see from time to time. We're also very much a global vehicle as well. Uh, and this will come out hopefully as I go through the various slides, that actually we're almost an ex-UK vehicle uh, for investors. And so if you think about the real asset space and how it's evolved, there's a lot of good um, op you know, opportunities and investments for clients to make, but a lot of them are still relatively UK centric. Uh, and three years ago when we were launching JARA, um, what we really felt and what you know, we were hearing from clients was that there's a need for that global diversifier for investors, particularly in the real asset space where one of the primary drivers of risk and return is local risk. Um, and by having this kind of global complement with only around 2% in the UK, we provide uh, investors the opportunity to, to, to do that. Um, the other big point for us around having uh, or being a cornerstone allocation is that we are focused on core assets. It's in our title, it's a, an important part of our ethos. And just to level set again at this stage, what we mean by core assets within the real asset space is really looking at the higher quality end of the spectrum. So uh, really for us, assets that are um, deriving the majority, typically two thirds plus, of their return from income. And importantly, that income is often uh, contracted or regulated. So it's predictable, uh, hopefully forecastable in nature. And importantly as well in this environment, as I'll get on to, uh, often it's that contracted and regulated income that is quite nicely uh, linked in, to inflation in some way. Uh, which is obviously an important an important aspect. A uh, second bullet point on here is also very important to, to the fund. The way we build our portfolio is using the JP Morgan Alternatives platform. This is a 210 billion or so platform that's been around for 50 years and has primarily been only open for the, the first kind of 49 of them years to uh, institutional investors, pension funds, insurance companies, endowments, etc. And really with JARA, what we're doing is we're accessing that uh, institutional platform, the private strategies, the private vehicles that sit with on them, on them. And we're able to, because of that, to build a portfolio quite unique in its scale. You now we are allocating here um, with a 250, 260 um, million dollar fund uh, to assets that collectively are around 70 billion in value because we're leveraging the power of the platform and we have over a thousand different private assets on a look through basis within the fund. So really able to reduce the idiosyncratic asset risk and counterparty risk that is often quite prevalent in this space. Uh, target returns seven to nine percent over a market cycle um, of which uh, four to six percent roughly that two thirds we hope to come uh, from income. On the left hand side, uh, you can just see bottom left hand side, you can see where we are in terms of returns over the last year. So what you can see first thing is actually very, very strong year uh, for us. Now, for, for the small print here, just to highlight, given the date of this, uh, our last quarterly NAV was 31st of August. And so the next one is the end of November, which we'll probably publish next week. So unfortunately, this is about as out of date as it can uh, get just because of the timing. Um, but nevertheless, through the end of August, you can see that actually strong NAV returns, almost 23%. This is in sterling, uh, of which roughly 21% we had on a share price basis. Now, a couple of things to note uh, on that. We are a global fund, and with that comes uh, global currency exposure. And so part of that very, very strong NAV return has been from um, the strengthening of the dollar over the year. Um, However, um, just within that kind of 23%, actually, we still had a strong 9% local currency return. So very much at the top end of uh, what we are targeting over market cycle. So a strong, resilient return uh, during what's obviously been a, a difficult year. And we've had that nice tailwind as well uh, from, uh, from dollar. Also, just to say that since this market, and we got, got reference in the last presentation, there's obviously been a lot of volatility uh, in the UK and you have seen a broad re-rating of real asset funds um, across the market and so we've gone from a, a single digit uh, premium at, at, this, at this number to a kind of high single digit discount along with what you've seen elsewhere um, but nevertheless still been able to provide some pretty decent resilient returns um, throughout the year. Um, 
Portfolio is uh, allocated just at a high level, 50-50, uh, 50% globally in real estate, and that is US and Asia Pacific real estate. We do not do UK and Europe, so we do not overlap with what a lot of investors have in their portfolio, and then 50% um, to other real assets. So with that, just to kind of set up, I wanted, you know, there's obviously been a, a lot of change going on this year. Um, and with that, actually, you know, clearly so has the change in terms of people's perception of the real asset market and also kind of that trade-off between um, the more public side and obviously the opportunity on, on the private side. There's obviously been a lot in the news recently uh, in terms of liquidity for the institutional investors. Now, what we have here is actually quite, you know, a... Um, an updated um, view from JP Morgan on our long-term capital market assumptions. Now, this is a, an annual review we do of every single asset class we invest across that basically says, what do we expect the returns for each asset class to be over the next 10 to 15 years? Now, this is a 2023 assumption, so just published. Um, and if you were to look at this in 2022, it would look totally different. Um, the purple... Um, the purple dots, which are the kind of real asset categories that we're broadly investing across, wouldn't have really changed. Our expectations of what the returns we're expecting from real assets is broadly consistent, in line with the resiliency and, uh, that they've seen through this year. But obviously the public markets have changed significantly given the re-rating. And actually that green line, the kind of stock bond frontier, would, be, would have been significantly below um, what you've seen uh, what you uh, see within the within the real asset space. So the market's changed. The opportunity set clearly in the public markets has changed. But nevertheless, you know, I think real assets, and I'll talk about some of the big structural trends that are going to drive the opportunity set going forward in a second, I think remain very, very important to a lot of investors' portfolios, even if not necessarily from an out-and-out -out return perspective, as much as they were. But given their resiliency, given their correlation benefits, which has been an important aspect this year, they still remain... Uh, a fundamental allocation, I think, for investors going forward. And a lot of investors broadly remain underweight still uh, to this part of the market. I think the other important thing to see on this um, page is how JARA sits quite nicely to the left of all the single real asset categories. And really this comes from the fact that real estate, infrastructure, transportation by themselves are good diversifiers to public markets. But actually, importantly, they're good diversifiers against each other. And so when you're able to put them in a solution like we have with JARA, you kind of get a double layer of diversification benefit, dragging down that volatility expectations to a number which actually does make JARA sit above the stock bond frontier and therefore uh, a good addition uh, to, to our portfolios in, people, in, in our mind. Now, as I mentioned, there is some... Uh, these have been the changes in terms of public versus private, but I still think you know there's a lot of structural trends and dynamics going on within the real asset space that um, are going to be strong tailwinds over over a number of years to come. Uh, and actually, we wrote a paper on this um, a couple of months ago, um, and similar to some of the big structural trends that were mentioned in the last um, presentation, and really how real assets are set to benefit from the potential emergence of what we've kind of termed the lifeboat economies. And really the lifeboat economy refers to how potentially we've seen peak globalization. As I mentioned in the last presentation, um, because of the Russia-Ukraine conflict, because of the general kind of nationalization of um, you know, politics and some of the views that have been going on there, actually our base case going forward is actually that economies retrenched somewhat into what we're calling these lifeboat economies where they often act within um, smaller groups uh, which they can you know, co uh, collaborate together in, in a more unique and more targeted way as opposed to the global one economy we've somewhat become uh, used to. Now, there's a number of um, impacts in our view to the real asset market on a, in a positive basis that that um, will see on an ongoing basis. And actually there was about five or six we highlighted in, the, in this paper. So for simplicity, I'll put two up here um, to highlight um, today. The first one is the expectation of higher inflation going forward. Um, and you know, that's both because of, um, as labor becomes uh, less, you know, less mobile, as we've got this new interest rate environment coming, uh, coming through, actually um, real assets should perform relatively well 
in a higher inflation environment, particularly core real assets. Because these core real assets, these, um, these assets that are deriving the majority of their return from um, regulated regimes, from contracts, um, these contracts are often inflation linked. So if we look, for example, at our Asia real estate portfolio, through annual rental increases from mark to market reviews and from um, literal inflation linkage on an annual basis, we'd expect roughly um, a 3.8% annual increase in our rental income uh, from that part of the portfolio. Now, obviously, in a kind of 10% year of inflation, that's you know, uh, not capturing the whole upside, but actually on, on an ongoing long-term basis, that should capture um, a significant piece of that. Similarly, in the infrastructure space, um, the renewables and the utility markets where we have a lot of our uh, allocation um, do have very, very strong inflation linkage uh, within, uh, within the contracts that they have. And importantly for us, um, a lot of this hasn't come through yet. It, you know, inflation doesn't go up and then a month later the regulator comes, comes to you and say, you know, please up, you know, increase your prices by 10%. Actually, the UK regulator is quite unusual in the frequency that they allow uh, utilities and the like to pass things on. On a global basis, it's typically done on a more annualised, um, if not less frequent, uh, basis. And so a lot of this is yet to come through and still, you know, still could be a tailwind um, going forward. The other part to say is actually, because we're focused at the core end of the spectrum, these are assets that, in our view, are positioned as really, really fundamental to the way we live our lives. And so if you look here on the left-hand side, this is just looking at utility um, spending as a percentage of household income. And you, there, are, there are bars where there's been recession, all that's come a bit too light for this, uh, for this screen. You can see that actually, broadly, when a recession hits, people do not stop spending on their bills. They do not stop necessarily spending on their rent. And actually, therefore, the demand side, even as um, household incomes get squeezed, should be pretty resilient in this space as well. The other uh, big trend to come from you know, what's gone on this year and also this kind of retrenchment into lifeboat economies is the one around energy independence and energy security. And there's you know, a huge number of areas you could highlight here, obviously renewable energy, which I want to talk about later, uh, being a key one and how countries and economies will be using this part of the market uh, to get more energy independence, but also the increasing prominence of liquid natural gas. And what we have here is the kind of that green bar is the important one, the, the forecast demand uh, for LNG uh, going forward, something that's been turbocharged this year as we can't rely on the more traditional sources uh, of gas coming from Russia going forward. Um, and this is a trend that actually we started investing in in around 2018, 2019. And so actually already have a pretty decent LNG exposure uh, through both LNG carriers, through um, bulk storage facilities, um, but clearly one that it, I think, you know, thought it was going to be important anyway, but has been turbocharged uh, as we go into, into this new regime. And here you can just see, before I get into the more specific exposures, where JAR currently sits on uh, some of these trends. So currently, if you look at our portfolio, we roughly have 20% of the portfolio allocated in some way to the energy transition. Uh, importantly for us, this is not just renewables. Um, you know, renewables is a big part of what we do. We own over six, six gigawatts worth of uh, generating capacity. Uh, this is a significant number. Um, and we look and we actually have a pipeline over the next kind of five to seven years to grow that to potentially 20 gigawatts of generating capacity. But we also have um, some other secondary exposures into markets like LNG, as we've talked about. And this is a, a part of the portfolio we do expect to continue to increase. E-commerce acceleration currently at 25%. Um, this is through things like container ships, but also through obviously the logistics space as well. Uh, and this is one that's actually evolved going back to that lifeboat economy um, trend probably from the e-commerce acceleration side to just in time to just in case where um, the role of um, the supply chain is evolving uh, and actually the logistics space is actually going to we think get a nice tailwind from that over the medium to long term as people look to go from one uh, supply chain to also you know near shoring uh, and then the increased demand that will take. 
5% also a growing allocation for us is in emerging core sectors. And this is how, as we've changed and evolved the way we live and the way we work and the way we shop as we've gone through the pandemic, um, new sectors have come online. Um, Chief Morgan, we're not necessarily going to be necessarily the first one to move into uh, some of these new sectors, but it is definitely a, uh, a growing part of the portfolio. So things like battery storage, things like biomass, power generation, uh, looking at things like data centers within the real, real estate side, all important, all assets we may not have invested in 5, 10, 15 years ago because we wouldn't have deemed them as core, are very much uh, increasingly becoming part of our portfolio and we expect to grow. And um, final thing to say is that throughout the portfolio we have integrated ESG, so it is part of our investment decision-making process, both in terms of how my team asset allocate across the portfolio, but also how we invest in the underlying uh, sleeves as well. So my team isn't allocate, it isn't managing every single asset within the portfolio. We have dedicated teams, the transportation team, the real estate team, the infrastructure team within JP Morgan, and they are also integrating it throughout their portfolio um, and making sure that actually, in our view, we're looking to own real assets for 5, 10, 20, 30 years in some cases. But actually doing it in a long-term, thoughtful way, considering your stakeholders, your consumers, your customers. You know, We serve through our real asset platform almost 10 million customers in our utilities. So making sure you do that in a long-term and a thoughtful way uh, actually for us makes sense in terms of generating uh, what we think can be the best possible return. Uh, we do undertake third-party rankings where possible. It's a bit of a, a difficult market, uh, slightly more opaque market uh, than obviously the public side. But so, for example, if you look at real estate, the global real estate sustainability benchmark is the main one investors use. And we do score very, very well. Uh, we were number one in 2021. The new rankings for, number, for 2022 have just come out. And we're number three in the US and number three in Asia. And still, so, still very, very um, up, you know, in terms of, the broader industry very much uh, at the forefront of that space. Here you can just see um, the portfolio's returns. Um, now, Jar, as I mentioned at the beginning, has been going for uh, three years. Um, and so if you look at since inception, we had an initial year of ramp up. So we wouldn't expect our since inception numbers to necessarily align with our target returns. But actually, if you look at the period since we've been fully invested, we've had some pretty strong uh, returns with the kind of ethos of the portfolio really coming out. So if you look at the last one year, then the numbers I highlighted earlier, a 4% income, it's very, very strong sterling return, but nevertheless a very, very resilient um, local currency return of 9%. And we're hoping obviously that's going to be the big driver of our long-term return, irrespective of currency. And you can also see just here bottom right, how in the last two years we've had very, very consistent returns at the top end of our target range on a local currency basis. Um, and we obviously hope that will continue going forward. So with that kind of rundown of where we see the big trends driving opportunity, but also um, our performance and what we're, how we're trying to take advantage of it, maybe just go on to how the portfolio is positioned today and some of the big um, trends we're seeing. Um, so far, I've talked about the big asset classes, real estate, infrastructure, transportation. Here you can just see on a look through basis where we're positioned sector by sector. Um, and you can also see, in our view, looking at our current pipelines, the direction of travel uh, for some of them. Now, if you'd have gone kind of a couple of quarters back, there'd have been much more green and red on that right hand side. The market has slowed a bit naturally as interest rates have increased and there's been a bit of a pause, particularly in some markets like real estate. But nevertheless, you know, there's obviously some long term opportunity you want to continue to take advantage of. A couple of broad things to make, uh, a couple of broad points to make at this stage. Um, within residential, sorry, within real estate, whilst we have a direction of travel which is broadly plain across um, or stable across our different sectors, big long term areas of conviction are industrial and residential. Um, industrial from that e commerce acceleration and the near shoring of supply chains um, being the big drivers there, particularly in Asia, where we still see a lot of opportunity in uh, the industrial space, still earning a 7 8% net leverage yield in a lot of markets like Singapore, like Australia, like Japan, and therefore continue to invest there. But also in residential where there continues to be a general shortage as interest rates have increased, 
Uh, we feel like the rental market will generally be supported in a lot of markets, uh, and so generally looking to increase there. Uh, on the infrastructure side, you can just see the two big categories we are invested in, uh, which makes up the significant part of our portfolio, which is utilities and uh, renewable energy. Um, importantly, these will very much likely stay the big areas we are continued to allocate to, primarily because these are the most core sectors. These are where you get the longer term contracts, the most stable return, that core return we're looking for. Um, but also importantly as well in this, in this environment, these are the most inflation linked areas as well, where you can get that um, inflation linkage on an ongoing basis. Final point to make on the transportation side, uh, where we're investing in transportation assets, um, maritime, energy logistics, aviation, and leasing them out to big counterparties like Shell, Rio Tinto, the, the big operators in that market. Uh, you can see we're very much a floating manager as opposed to a flying manager. So we're focused on maritime and energy logistics, so container ships, uh, LNG carriers would fall into these two categories. And very much the energy logistics side is one that we're increasing, particularly because that's where LNG sits, um, because we have a high conviction there going forward. We also have made a new allocation at the bottom to real estate debt, and I'll talk about that in a bit more detail in a second. Now, I've talked about JARA being global and just maybe want to make that point one more time because it's an important part, I think, for us, but also how we fit into a lot of our shareholders' portfolios. Uh, you can just see here our geographic diversification, over 50% in North America, um, only 2% in the UK, so very little overlap to what a lot of investors are already doing, 15% Europe and 27% uh, in Asia Pacific. You can also see just the significant diversification we have by assets and by countries as well. Uh, also just worth bringing your attention to uh, this bottom graph, which is just looking at our currency exposure. Um, so with that global allocation comes a global currency exposure that you know, always useful to be aware of. Uh, and we do have that dollar bias of around 65%. Um, you know, been an exceptional time for currency markets this year. Over the long term, we hope that it will be the local currency return that really drives the story. Um, but nevertheless, it will have a, a shorter term, can have a shorter term impact from time to time and worth being aware of. A um, couple of big uh, areas just to kind of highlight that we're going to be driving going forward in the portfolio. Uh, first is on this renewable side. Um, on the left hand side, you can see how the energy mix is expected to change. Uh, this is a kind of uh, a view from BP. That green line is the renewable side. And if anything, this from when it got done, that green line has got steeper as countries are looking to accelerate that transition as a result of the Russia-Ukraine conflict. And it's just worth noting that we are very, very well positioned uh, to take advantage of, that, of, of this market. We already have at JP Morgan, 5 billion invested in renewable energy. Our portfolio is enough to power New York and LA. It is a big, big number and is able to grow uh, going forward. JARA has allocation to that portfolio uh, alongside the other institutional investors. In total, it says over six gigawatts worth of generating capacity. And we did make one quite transformational change this year or allocation this year that out allowed us to get to uh, that number where we actually took a, a company private. It was listed on the Italian Stock Exchange, a global renewables company. And we took it private and added around three gigawatts worth of generating capacity in one go. Now, it's a good example because that um, Alec, that, that actual company was three and a half billion in enterprise value. This is a big, big number and a public to private transaction is obviously a difficult thing to execute. But it was transformational for our portfolio, um, both in terms of the actual existing allocation, but also the pipeline. So a lot of the pipeline I talked about to, to get towards that kind of 20 gigawatt number uh, is coming from that investment. Um, but importantly, we can take that investment down without it being a massive part of JARA's portfolio. On a look-through basis, that asset makes around 3% of the portfolio. Uh, and so we can have that allocation, but because we're investing with the broader JP Morgan platform, we're able to uh, make sure that we still remain diversified um, and get, allocate, get allocations towards these differentiated types of assets. Um, on the liquid natural gas side, uh, I've mentioned this a couple of times, just worth saying that we have been doing this since 2019. However, we decided in 2019 not 
to go and buy second-hand assets. And this is really because of the pie chart you see on the left-hand side where you can see in the LNG space, there's been a variety of different engine types out there. And around 2018, 2019 was an inflection point where we felt the new technology was going to be really market leading going forward. And so we took the opportunity to put on new build contracts for assets um, that were taking advantage of the newest technology that is out there. This new technology basically allows the LNG carrier to burn LNG as a fuel as well and makes the LNG carrier around 60% more fuel efficient than older 10, 15 year old, old assets in that sector. In total now, we've built an order book of 26 LNG carriers. And given these are big, huge ships, uh, roughly 180 to $200 million a time, um, they don't come overnight. So we put these, these uh, contracts on in 2019 and they're getting delivered this year. Typically one a quarter uh, between starting at the beginning of this year and moving into kind of the next 12 to 18 months. Uh, and by the end of getting all of these, uh, we will be the second largest, given current numbers, uh, LNG owner in the world. Um, big counterparties in that space, good long-term contracts, and importantly, not an excessive part of JARA either, 5%, maybe 6% of JARA. So we're able to take, again, differentiated assets because we're investing alongside the platform without having necessarily over, uh, over allocated to any one area. We are, of course, cognizant about the market environment as well. Um, and we have been making um, you know, movements within the portfolio from an asset allocation perspective to make sure we're more defensive. Um, so just here, you know, a big thing we've been focusing on over the last 12 months has been around our leverage level. Top left-hand side, you can see how that has not fallen quite nicely over, over the last kind of two years. So a peak of 42% down to around 36% uh, now. And importantly, uh, we've been working with the platform and making sure that actually a majority of that is fixed as well. So actually, in terms of as rates have risen, that isn't expected to be a material drag on our portfolio with only around, around 5 to 10% of the portfolio debt um, expiring in any one year. We've also recently made an allocation to um, real estate debt. Um, so as the real estate market has had a very strong 12 to 18 months, but potentially looks to have a pause and, and see some, uh, some uh, capital um, impact over the next couple of quarters. We've actually moved up the capital structure. Uh, around 7 or 8% of our portfolio has gone into the debt side, giving us an 8% yield uh, with a strong equity cushion as well. And so making sure that we're actively allocating uh, to be more defensive as we go, uh, as we go into uh, a period of slower growth. Um, so I think I'm at time to so just to say, look, we've been here, uh, we've been around for three years, we've progressed quite nicely. Our chairman often likes to say it's been a baptism of fire, launching in September 19 and going straight into the pandemic. But nevertheless, uh, the performance has started to come through uh, since we've been fully invested. We are increasingly owning, I think, unique and differentiated assets. Uh, we've grown the vehicle from 150 IPO to nearly 250 today, and hopefully that can continue, um, particularly given the types of assets, the types of portfolios we're able to get access to to JP Morgan. Um, and so with that, I'll pause and uh, hand over to the next presenter. Thank you. Thanks so much, Philip. Um, again, brilliant timekeeping. So uh, we're bang on time. Uh, still not done yet. Um, we go. So next up, uh, we've got uh, Emily Fletcher from BlackRock. Fantastic. Thank you very much for having me. I'm Emily Fletcher. I'm co-manager of the BlackRock Frontier Markets Investment Trust. Um, and I, I, I think we were told if we wanted, we could leave five minutes at the end for questions. If anyone does have a question, I'm happy to answer questions on absolutely anything. So um, if there are any um, at the end, I'm really happy to answer those. Um, if we were to uh, talk a little bit about the, the Frontier Markets Investment Trust, um, I think this might be an interesting slide to start on. Um, you can see on this slide um, some of the variety of countries where we're invested um, across the world. And you can see that the opportunity set is pretty wide. That ranges um, all across Latin America, across Eastern Europe, across Southeast Asia, anything from agricultural companies, healthcare companies, um, new energy companies. Um, a lot of what we do is really focused on domestic growth. Um, and we think that's a really interesting uh, place to do in order to capture 
what we see is, is the growth that happens um, within frontier markets. Um, if we were to um, think a little bit about why frontier markets are interesting at the moment, um, I think we can pick up really on what both of the last two speakers have been talking about. Um, but particularly to go back to where we were thinking about some of the global dynamics at the moment. Um, I, we would totally agree with the first speaker that we would expect inflation to surprise on the downside this year, um, having surprised, obviously, on the upside this year. Surprising on the upside has been difficult for emerging markets. Um, it's raised the cost of capital. Emerging markets tend to be countries which borrow from overseas, um, are reliant on external capital. So that, that rise in cost of capital is bad for emerging markets in general. However, I think where we are at the moment, I think that the case for emerging markets is becoming stronger and stronger. And that's because emerging markets, uh, the fundamentals within emerging markets, I think, have really changed quite substantially. Um, I think we are in an environment where emerging markets are much less reliant on, ex on external capital than they have been. I think we're in an environment where a lot of the countries where we would have questioned the sustainability of external debt um, have, have resolved those problems, have been forced to resolve those problems. I think we're in an environment where emerging markets weren't able to take on a lot of debt during COVID. Um, I think a lot of them would have loved to in the same way the West did in order to support its populations, but markets didn't allow, it to, allow them to. Um, and hence, they're now in a much better position. I think we, what we will see from emerging markets is that they're likely to be some of the first countries in the world that will see, well, a lot of them have seen inflation peaking, but that um, will see rates peaking will be some of the first to cut rates. And generally, within emerging markets, which tend to be deeply cyclical, that point where you get the change in cycle, where you get those turning points, are when the markets tend to do very well. So when liquidity moves from being tightened to loosened, emerging markets tend to do very well. And we should see that environment during the course of this year. Within the context of emerging markets, here we're really talking about frontier markets, we're talking about the really small countries, the countries that are probably even more reliant on external capital. Um, but despite that, uh, actually what we have seen over the last couple of years is they've tended to be, certainly in terms of performance, much less cyclical um, than what we've seen in emerging markets. So along with that surprising fact, I'm going to present what I think are sort of three other uh, currently surprising facts, uh, interesting points maybe about uh, frontier markets as to why we think they're kind of interesting at the moment. Um, and the first of these really speaks to uh, one of the, the big regions within frontier markets. I think there's three, maybe four, depending exactly how you define it, big regions within frontier markets. And the first of these uh, would be the GCC, the Middle East. Unsurprisingly, the Middle East economies are fairly reliant on oil and therefore have had a good year this year. Um, we are going to see current account and fiscal surpluses that are the highest for 10 years. Um, as a result of that, uh, what we see is that these countries are able to support their domestic populations. Inflation at the moment in Saudi Arabia is 3%. In the UAE, it's 2.5%. Two, two um, that means that we, we haven't seen the same pressures on domestic economic growth. Uh, where we are invested in this region is not in oil and gas producers. It's in, for example, a chain of female-only gyms, you know, benefiting from a secular trend. Um, we're invested in real estate companies in Dubai, um, again, really benefiting, I think, from a secular trend. Um, and what um, we're showing in the chart on the other side of the page is just the lack of capex that we've seen into, the, into oil and gas. It's really surprising. Normally, globally, you have a commodity that does very well. You have very strong capex investment into that area. What's surprising, I think, has been the extent and the duration of the capital discipline that we've seen in this sector such that we haven't had substantial investment. I'm sure that will change. This is still a cyclical industry. At some point, people will decide oil prices are going to stay high um, and they will start investing behind that. I think we've seen some of that already um, during the year. Um, but at the moment, you know, this is something where maybe these trends could stay in place for longer, given that lack of investment. Another re reason, sorry, why I think that this area of the world is interesting to talk about is perhaps some of the geopolitical trends that, again, the first two speakers have picked up on. Um, if we are to think about the fragmentation uh, that we have seen between West and East uh, post the Russian invasion of Ukraine, 
Um, I think where that is made, uh, I think we've seen the world divide into three. And I think where that is made really starkly clear is if we were to look at some of the votes at the UN um, around some of the issues such as Russia. And what we've clearly seen is that the world has divided into three. There are those who have voted on one side very much with the Western Bloc. I think there are those who have voted very clearly on the other side with the Eastern Bloc. But then we come to about a third of the world countries um, and a lot of emerging markets. So that would be Brazil, India, Saudi Arabia, some of the biggest examples um, that have chosen to abstain for the majority of these votes um, and really are sitting, it, it, trying to sit in the neutral camp on the majority of these issues. I think some of these countries, um, which where the Middle East would feature highly, um, are likely to benefit from transfers of capital. I think these are likely to be seen as uh, good places to invest your wealth. And, and we've seen a huge boom in some of the property price, uh, prices, but also volumes of sales um, in the region um, in the course of this year. It really is a fallout from some of the geopolitical tensions that we've seen. But I think, again, that's a trend that's likely to persist um, as we don't see these trends really abating, I don't think, in the next couple of years. Um, if we move on then to perhaps talk about inflation and how inflation has impacted frontier markets, inflation obviously being one of the key things we've talked about this year, then I think um, the world that I look at in frontier markets would probably divide in, into two sides. And the more surprising side, I think, is the side featured here, which is that there are quite a lot of countries that haven't been hugely impacted by inflation. You can see all the countries highlighted are in frontier markets, and the data set is, is a very random selection, I would agree with you, but it's everything we could find. Um, so you can see there's quite a lot of countries where actually energy prices really aren't up this year. You know, they get, that goes back to, for example, inflation at the moment in Vietnam is 4.3%, is that compares to Germany at 10%. Uh, I think something you would never have expected me to say, um, those two statements in the same sentence. Um, but there is a good proportion of our world, it's about half, so that would be the Middle East and then Southeast Asia, where we've seen very little impact um, on inflation from energy prices this year. But then we come on to the other half of the world, uh, which is where we've seen very, very significant impacts on inflation. So this would be Latin America and Eastern Europe. Um, you can see from the left-hand chart um, that inflation, which is the dots, has been way outside what's the historic norm, which is kind of the bars. And you can see that that's true for a majority of the Western world in the same way it's true for Eastern Europe and Latin America. I think, though, where the real difference is, is what you see when you look on the right-hand side of the chart. And this is where we're saying that we think emerging markets are quite well positioned from here, which is that central banks have reacted very strongly in the majority of these countries, such that in Chile, for example, we have the highest rates that, um, that we've seen since 1996, apart from a very brief three-month period in 1998. It may well be the highest for longer than that, just 1996 is when my Bloomberg terminal goes back to. Uh, I think we've got the highest rates we've seen for 14, 15 years in Hungary, a uh, similar length of time in um, Peru as well, similar length of time of Poland, but we haven't shown Poland here. Um, so we've seen central banks react really, really strongly in these countries. And they have taken um, very defensive action. We've seen similar from governments. Um, I think the shift in fiscal spend in Hungary uh, that's been announced over the last six months is about 4% of GDP. So very, very significant fiscal tightening. Um, and that, again, is really just in very sharp contrast to what we have seen in the Western world. So um, these countries are significantly further through um, their, their rate hiking cycle, such that the, the likely moves for all of these, or certainly the moves in the next quarter or so for all of these, is more likely, I think, to be downwards than upwards. Um, and, and that's a very different position to be in. Um, and hence, as a result of that, what we've seen is some of these stock markets have done very badly, and assets and currencies are looking very cheap. We tend to see that equity markets and currencies are positively correlated in the majority of frontier markets, and the moment they look really good in these countries. And then we come on to the third reason, and this one I think is less, less surprising, but a third one why we, reason why we think some of these countries are, are interesting and really trying to pick up then on sort of the third or fourth, depending how you define Eastern Europe and Latin America, um, area of the world that we invest in, in Southeast Asia. So Southeast Asia had a very interesting COVID because it, um, it removed its restrictions. It came out of COVID very, very late compared to the rest of the world, such that I think in terms of tourism, we only really saw a pickup in tourist volumes as of about the last three to six months. 
Um, and so what we are seeing at the moment is, is quite a significant economic acceleration in the majority of countries um, in Southeast Asia, really on the back of, of the, the trends that we've seen elsewhere that we all stopped talking about anywhere else in the world about 12 months ago. Um, but that has continued. I think the other thing we're seeing as a result um, of cheap labor prices is an outsourcing to Southeast Asia. That's again, you know, a story you can see here that's been going on for 10 years. But I think where it's really been accelerated is through some of the geopolitical tensions um, that we're seeing such that a lot of companies in the West are looking for more neutral grounds to place their manufacturing. Um, and we are seeing as a result of that quite significant benefit into areas such as uh, Vietnam, um, consumer electronics that are produced there, but also I'd say in terms of new energy from somewhere like Penang in Malaysia, um, we're seeing benefits in Thailand and obviously Philippines continues to benefit from, from BPO and outsourcing there. So uh, that is an area that I think will continue to attract significant FDI. Uh, nickel in Indonesia is the other one I think that's worth talking about, which we think really has the potential to have very substantial benefits on the, the current account dynamics in Indonesia and really make Indonesian growth more sustainable and less cyclical than it has in the past. Um, so if we come on to talk a little bit more about sort of the aggregate of the trust and where it's positioned. Um, so again, you know, as I said, what we're really looking to do in the trust is to pick up some of these uh, domestic or to, to pick up domestic sources of growth, to take what I talked about at a really global level and bring it down to, to the company level and find the companies um, that are really benefiting from that domestic growth in some of these countries. We think it's really important to have a global fund and we do move the fund and positions quite actively between countries. If you had to go back about four or five years, we have 40% of the fund in Sri Lanka, Pakistan and Bangladesh. And currently we would have zero in, in all th three of those combined and um, all three actually experiencing some pretty difficult uh, macroeconomic and political uh, scenarios at the moment. So it's really important for us that we do have a global fund and that we are able to move it around um, pretty actively. Um, you can see that the valuation on the trust um, stacks up pretty favourably, I think, compared with, um, with, with larger markets. Um, everything we invest in, uh, we think uh, we should, on aggregate, we think we'll see an earnings growth of 10 to 15% a year. We think we have seen that um, in the time that we've been invested in these markets over the last 12 years. Um, and that really has continued. So we think that these markets stack up pretty favorably on a growth basis in terms of the earnings growth that we're seeing. But as you can see from here, they also stack up pretty favorably on a valuation basis. I don't know exactly what makes these markets close the gap. Uh, I don't know exactly at what point that will come. Um, but it is uh, interesting to us, I think, the, the extent of which that, that valuation discount is there. It will always be there. It should be there to some extent. Frontiers sounds inherently risky. And that's probably a fair classification. Um, but at the moment, that gap is looking pretty wide. If we come on to performance, you can see it there on the slide. I think we have to show it. Um, but I think, you know, the thing that is, is worth highlighting is the performance relative to emerging markets um, over the past uh, year or three years. I think on a three-year basis, um, emerging markets, the, the aggregate index is up 8%. And I think on a one-year basis, emerging markets are down 8%, somewhere around those levels in pound terms. So you can see it's a period of time where actually the frontier market performance has very seriously diverged from uh, the emerging market performance. It, it, it does at some points, at other points it underperforms. It's, it's not always that it's different, but I think it is interesting to know that it can. Um, this is a slide that we've shown, I think, since uh, we launched the investment trust. And again, it's something that really surprises people, that you can put together a combination of Kazakhstan, Vietnam, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Argentina, and produce a fund that has lower volatility than the FTSE. Um, I think, you know, that, that that's what diversification is. You know, we wouldn't tend to have more than about 20% in a single country. That's because you could wake up on any given morning and there could be a coup and you could come in and, you know, your market's marked down 50%. Well, actually, that's what we used to say. But then we had investments in Russia, not in this fund at all, and markets were marked down 100%. But um, it is really important, I think, that you have diversification across portfolios. You know, we, would, we don't run a single country fund in any of these countries. Um, and it's important because it's really different to what we see in, in, in much more developed markets where, you know, on a given day, the, the NASDAQ will be up and that probably means that uh, Chinese internet names are up and it probably means that Brazil is up. 
here, you know, when, and it's probably because she said something in China and at the moment probably about COVID opening. Um, but actually what we see here is really different. So, for example, yesterday the um, deputy president in Argentina was sentenced to six years in jail. I, I think it's extremely unlikely that she... I expect it will go to appeal. It's, I think, probably what I'm allowed to say on that one. Um, but... Um, it, you know, that is a political event that probably has consequences for the country, but it has absolutely zero consequences for anything that's going on in Kazakhstan, has zero consequences for what's going on in Thailand or Vietnam. And as a result of that, we just have these really different market movements, whereby they're moved by um, idiosyncratic events in each of the countries, and which have no, because there's no trading relationship, have, have basically no impact on other countries where we are invested. And hence, you can end up with, with something like this. Um, this is, these slides just give you some idea of where we're invested globally. Um, you can see the huge, broad range of countries, um, as I said. And maybe just to, to pick out a couple of examples in terms of Kazakhstan, for example, what we're invested there. Um, we own a fintech company um, that is trading on something like six times PE with a 6% dividend yield. And last year grew earnings by about 50%. It's the sort of valuation that I don't think you can find many other places in the world. Um, it's trading so cheaply because it's near Russia. Um, and because earlier this year there was potentially a coup um, earlier this year, end of last year. So obviously significant um, macroeconomic, well, I think not really macroeconomic, political risks of investing there, but I think the valuation more than fully accounts for it. Um, and it's, uh, area, yeah, it's, you know, we held it within a diversified portfolio. Um, I think other areas to note um, would be Indonesia. And again, as I talked about, we're seeing very, very substantial increase in nickel exports in Indonesia. Um, I think it's got the second largest um, size of reserves of nickel globally. Obviously, really, really important commodity uh, for batteries. Um, and um, the exports of nickel from Indonesia, I think, are meant to move to something like four or five percent of GDP in terms of the swing on balance of payments. So, you know, something that can really, really change um, economic outlook for Indonesia. Um, and they are expected, I think, to increase their production of nickel by about sort of four times uh, from where we were last year. So very, very, very substantial um, improvement. And that, again, I think is slightly where a lot of these countries sit, that so they're slightly higher up that value chain, but still very much involved um, in the trends that we're seeing globally in terms of um, move towards electric vehicles. Chile is another country um, where we're invested, which is experiencing similar trends, but they're really about lithium and copper. Um, but that being very, very substantial drivers um, of some of the economic trends um, and that allowing the domestic economy to continue to grow well. In terms of where we're invested by sector, you can see it here. Um, particularly large, obviously, is financials. But again, I think it's really important to remember that, that in a lot of these countries, that is how we're able to access some of these domestic growth trends. Um, and again, I think an example we sometimes give is if you were to take Credit Suisse and HSBC and JP Morgan um, and uh, Bank of China, Hong Kong, something like that, you know, those are all banks which are listed in different countries, but the business that they're doing, the aggregate trends are very much global and it's going to be driven by what's happening globally. Whereas, you know, I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm saying the same thing, but if you were to go back to Halleck Bank in Kazakhstan and you were to own Banco Macro in Argentina and you were to own Tecon Bank in Vietnam, you know, these are very, very much driven by what is happening in their local markets. Um, and hence the correlation is much less than you would expect um, globally uh, in that sector. And you can see the names of the stocks, the top 10 where we're invested here as well. Um, this chart, again, just showing the divergence in performance between the various indices. It's an interesting place to start it. If you take it back longer, then I, I think it looks quite so favourable. But it is really interesting, I think, to see that there can be quite such substantial divergence. And I think I'm required to pause on the disclaimers at the end to make sure you have all seen them um, to the extent that you would, you would like to. Thanks, Emily. Um, we're going to manage this um, as best we can. Um, I guess I was supposed to have a microphone, but I haven't got it now, so maybe Marisa could uh, go around with it if there are any questions. But um, I guess opportunity now to ask Emily any questions, but also um, any other questions for the managers that are more broad that you don't want to talk about privately or informally. Um, but maybe just to be absolutely clear, maybe specify who, who you're asking the question to, um, because we don't want Emily asking questions about US tips, I suspect. Although well, I'm sure you'd give a good, um, a good go at it. Um, any questions for anyone? Right, well, um, that's absolutely fine. Luckily, we've got um, 
plenty of time for sort of informal questions over lunch. So um, I think it's been an absolutely fantastic set of presentations and well done, Pascal, for curating them all. Um, uh, on your behalf, I'd like to thank uh, all of the presenters, um, but especially also Marisa from our side, who's put everything together so brilliantly. So um, thank you all very much. I look forward to seeing you over lunch. Thank you.